I think that the, the question under the question is, how are you affecting people? What, Im, what are you doing to people <laughs> for good or ill? And that's the question that they still don't, I'm still seeing another chance for there to be another self-inflicted wound of handling this new question of how have you harmed people? Because a lot of people who are deconstructing have been harmed. Or how have you become irrelevant? And the church that asks that self, themselves that question and goes and starts to seek repair and make amends and do better is going to be have one story. And the church that just says, you're the problem. You know, any harm that you did was because you didn't come with the right heart or whatever. I think it's it's getting just getting easier and easier for people to be like, then I'm going to leave. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson. Before we get to this week's guest, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to all of you for your support. Um, since dealing with the passing of my mom and my dad's major surgery, it's meant a lot to me and gotten me through these last few months. Uh, I really wanted to have at least a couple new episodes for you guys before the end of 2022. But as it would happen, both grief and flu season had other plans. But hey, I have a good one for you this week. Uh, to finish off the year, this is a topic that people have been asking about for years. And to be honest, we weren't avoiding it, just waiting for someone to create material. Or shit. This is a topic people have been asking about for years. And to be honest, we weren't avoiding it, just waiting for someone to create material around it. This week's guest is journalist Becca McNeil. Becca's work has appeared in Christianity Today. Sojourners, Relevant, The Texas Tribune, ESPN's The Undefeated, The Christian Science Monitor, Texas Public Radio, and others. In addition to writing pieces about parenting, she writes about education, immigration, and faith communities, as well as the occasional op-ed calling the American Evangelical Church to lay down its idols of white supremacy and patriarchy. She's also the author of the amazing book, Bringing Up Kids When Church Lets You Down, A Guide for Parents Questioning Their Faith. So Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and here's to a much better year in 2023. I'll be back soon with all new episodes in 2023 after taking off the usual month in January to record. So until then, I love you guys, and without further ado, Becca freaking McNeil. A face like a Tina and I met a Mildred A Russ and his husband Gus and their children All right, welcome to the podcast. Becca McNeil, I'm so excited to have you on. We were just talking about your book uh, that we'll cover in this episode, but thank you so much for taking some time out to be with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. So we were just talking about the fact that, you know, a long time ago, uh, almost the better part of a decade now, which is insane. Uh, when Adam and I started this podcast, a lot of people were reaching out, not just about their own deconstruction of their own spiritual journeys and their own spiritual like progress uh, or evolution, as it were. Um, but a lot of people were saying, how do I raise my kids now that I don't believe these certain things anymore? And at that time, there was really nothing out there. So Tell me a little bit about what prompted you to write this book. It, it, that that exact situation is what prompted <laughs> me to write it. Um, a lot of people were talking and there was no books. And so when I pitched it, I think um, I'm a first time author without a million Instagram followers. And so the only reason the publishers would give me a time of day is because everybody I pitched it to said, I just talked to somebody about this. We just were talking about how we wished there was a book. <laughs> and so that, that was what fueled it. Like, that's how I got an agent. That's how I got a publisher. <laughs> that's, that's uh, amazing. Everybody who's on board with the book is living through it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there really isn't much in the way of resources out there. And, you know, a lot of us kind of just went through it in real time. And in fact, um, when I first started going through my own deconstruction at that point, I didn't really have a term for it. Um, you know, we kind of picked up on this term that was sort of just beginning to become part of the zeitgeist. And we knew it was kind of, um, 
you know, attention grabbing or whatever, but it kind of gave me a name to what experience I was going through. And the whole reason I kind of kicked it off was because I was getting ready to become a dad for the first time. And I really wanted to sit down and think, you know, what do I, what do I truly believe? Why do I believe the things that I believe? How am I going to raise this future child? And so it was kind of interesting that that's what kind of kickstarted my own deconstruction. And at that point there was nothing. I mean, there were barely resources on deconstruction at the time. Now there's just tons out there, tons of resources. But, um, tell me a little bit about, cause obviously what led to your, uh, deconstruction, it might be very, very different, but talk about your upbringing and how were you raised when it comes to religion? So I was raised in the Presbyterian church in America, though, like kind of, I would say fundamentalist branch of the Presbyterians, um, which I said that to someone in New York the other day and they were like, uh, those aren't fundamentalists and Presbyterians are not usually what I think of in, like, eh, in the South, you got to go to the South, right. um, but it is the more conservative branch of Christianity uh, of Presbyterianism. And in the particular, I was in Texas. And so it has its own flavor here as well. That is a, even a little more um, cowboy ish in the sense of <laughs> we're the only ones getting it right. Of course, we're all getting mm-hmm. it right, right? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> all 45,000 denominations are getting it right. And then I met all of the other people who were getting it right and mm. and telling me I was not the one getting it right. And then I was very confused. <laughs> yeah, and I do appreciate in the book, you, you do kind of make mention of the fact that there are, not only are there different uh, streams of thought when it comes to Christianity and different uh, variations, but even within some of these kind of more historic denominations, because I find myself trying to explain to people who don't know, it's born and raised Lutheran, but Lutheran is not Lutheran is not Lutheran at all. There are very wide differences between say ELCA Lutheran and Wisconsin Synod Lutheran, very huge, big gaps. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did appreciate the fact that you did, you know, you did make mention of that in, in the book. Um, so talk a little bit about, so you are born and raised Presbyterian. Obviously you have kind of your foundational beliefs kind of set for you. And, uh, as Richard Rohr would say, you've got your foundation to kick against, you know, I love that turn of, yeah. I love the way he puts that. Yes. Yeah. It's so true. Cause you don't really know what to, I guess, where to go if, if you don't have some sort of foundation, even if it's not where you land later in life. And so, Right. You're getting older and you go away to college just like everybody and you start kind of thinking about things for yourself. And so what was kind of the first thing that caused a kind of a a tear in the fabric? Sure, sure. Well, it wasn't college because college for undergrad, I went to the master's college in <laughs> um, Santa Clarita, California, which is John MacArthur's college. And so that only made things more... <laughs> Um, made me more anxious about being certain about everything. It was when I went to graduate school. I went to the London School of Economics, and the first thing to go was actually the very American-centric view of the world. That was where I... George Bush was president at the time. George W. Bush. I'm not that old. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was, you know, the early mid two thousands and just hearing different perspectives on the war in Iraq, hearing different perspectives on America as, you know, this shining city on a hill and whatnot. And then I started to think more and more about how much American values were tied up in my faith. And I started to meet people just like I was meeting people from other countries who were speaking about, um, you know, who had a view of America that wasn't mine view of the United States. That wasn't mine. I was hearing other views about Christianity and I was starting to learn about colonialism and I was starting to learn about globalization and, um, religious language and political speech and that kind of stuff. And I just started to hear other people for the first time and not in a debate setting or in a theoretical debate setting, not in a, here's what they might say to you to make you 
get off course and not believe in Jesus, but in a, a, I was learning from them and being friends with them. And I had friends who were from different places, different religions. And basically through that started to not, I wouldn't say it was the case of, Oh, I can't bear the thought of all my friends going to hell. I mean, I wish it was that human and compassionate, but really (laughs) it was more of just the practice of listening. And Mm. once I started doing that, instead of always just arguing in my head, um, I started to just question more things that I had only been able to maintain because I had shut off certain conversations. And once I started having those conversations, I had to ask myself hard questions. And that's when the the fabric started to fray a little bit. Interesting. I, it, it's funny. I remember uh, talking with a friend of mine just about the fact that I, I, I really feel like the answer or part of the answer to all of, all of this is, is once you start to meet people who are outside of your bubble, you know, people who have different life experiences, who come from different cultures, who have different ways of seeing the world, it sort of has an effect of like rupturing, you know, kind of this, I don't know, um, echo chamber that, that you kind of are stuck in, whether consciously or unconsciously it exists, but then it, it kind of broadens your world a little bit. It, it kind of, you're forced to see things a little differently and to, to maybe acknowledge, uh, that maybe we don't have all the answers and it just starts this process of saying, okay, maybe, maybe there's a broader way, a more loving way, more inclusive way to look at things. It's kind of interesting how that, how that happens. Yeah. I think you start actually listening and not, they talk a lot about in effective communication. You can't be already thinking of your response as Mm. the person is talking. And I think in the kind of combative evangelicalism that I grew up in, it was, one step further in that I was picking from a pre determined list of arguments, like which one am I going to put in here whenever I would listen to someone who didn't agree with me. And one of the things that had to happen was that I had to start having friendships with people I actually cared about and wanted to listen to. And two, I had to start get, getting exposing myself to conversations that weren't pre accounted for. That was like, Oh yeah, they're going to totally say this. Like everybody prepared an evangelicalism, how to debate Richard Dawkins. Right. And, yeah. and you're like, you're never going <laughs> to debate that person, you know, no. and, or they, here's how you combat people who say that a loving God would never send people to hell. Like we're going to, debate the problem of evil. No one was debating the problem of evil, but there were so many conversations that I hadn't been prepared for. And when I didn't have those ready arguments to go to, I had to start listening and actually hearing them and, and thinking for myself. Yeah. Around this, it it sounds like, you know, as you start to sort sort of ask questions, then it's kind of enforced, you know, by meeting your your husband, which I'm sure he appreciated, by the way, uh, the, the part about him being very handsome in there. So it was, <laughs> I'm sure he's like, thank you, thank you. Um, he actually hates it, which is why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. But like he was, he sounds like he was a really good support system in a time where a lot of people can feel very isolated and alone. But he sounds like he was very supportive and gentle and kind of allowed you space to kind of maneuver and try to figure things out. Yeah. He actually was one of the instigators to, because after graduate school, I still came back and worked for the church. So like I had started to question things, but I was very open to having that system rebuilt and saying like, maybe I can just be that kind of fun person who everybody likes at church. Who's always asking the hard questions, you know, everybody, every church has like, Oh, that's just because she asks <laughs> hard questions or whatever, but they're still towing the party line. They're still doing what they should. And I kind of thought, saw myself as that person. And I would be persnickety about certain doctrines or whatever social issues, but was still orthodox enough or still, um, the opposite of heretical the word is escaping me right now um, enough to have the job work for the church, you know, talk to college kids about Jesus, whatever. 
And it was my husband when I met him and he started to get to know the church that I was working in. He was one of the ones going like, this is, how do you feel about swearing on your show? I uh, love it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> you never know. Um, he was just no, like, this, no is, this is kind of bullshit because <laughs> yeah. you are, you, you have a master's degree, you love this stuff and you're never going to be a path. Like you're never going to, promote. You're never going to get any more money or position or anything. And the church was kind of passing that off as like, yes, because it is the woman's privilege to not have to care about that stuff. You know, you get to be like Jesus and serve humbly and all this stuff. And it's like, and he was just like, no, (laughs) no, no, mm -mm, I don't buy it. And (laughs) so he, the whole time was like, you're being taken advantage of and things that others had said to me before but, you know, hearing it from my, at the time, like fiance and newlywed husband, I was much more like, oh, okay. So I start advocating for myself and then it really hits the fan <laughs> because it's one thing to like have doctrinal discussion. It's a totally other thing to, to want to be treated differently than the church wants to treat you. And that's when things really fell apart. And he was great throughout the whole thing. I mean, he was more than happy to be like, you take your time. Let's leave the church. We don't have to go back anytime soon. During COVID, even now, our our little church um, did not make it out of the pandemic like so uh. many little churches. And we have not been in a hurry to find another one. It's been years at this point now since we've been to church and he is very much like, you know, like he's, yeah. Yeah. we've, we've very mercifully been on the same page for most of this journey. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and I think, um, kind of the role of church, I think you kind of talk about this a little bit in the book, it kind of shifts, I think. And for me, it's always been more about, I miss the community aspect of it and kind of the social aspect. But, um, I felt for a long time, especially during the pandemic, when we were kind of forced to, during lockdown, I've kind of been able to find the other outlets elsewhere without Mm -hmm. having to step foot into a sanctuary somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I went, I did go to a friend, a service, a friend of mine is married to a Lutheran, uh, minister and he was being installed at a church here in town And so I went to the service. This was just the other day. And I was kind of like, this is going to be a great test because I grew up liturgical (laughs) and I like liturgy and I like the structure of it and all that stuff. And I typically have like a pretty good emotional response, but I didn't know a soul in this church except for my friend who was way up at the front. And I found myself after all this time away being like, oh, I think my my um, love for the liturgy and and collective readings and stuff had a lot more to do with the people who were around me also saying it and my love for them and my connection to them. Yeah. Um, Doing this alone is extremely tedious. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and then I also thought about, and I need to try it and see if this holds true for like a, a more Anabaptist or, you know, I would, (laughs) non-liturgical service, if any of the, that feeling of connection to it, if I, if I still kind of have the capacity even for that without the community. And what does that mean? Because now you're in a new place where you go, well, do you go start forming a community somewhere? Do you find a place where you like what they're about and try to get attached and try to start, you know, re-engaging spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, Or do you take the relationships that you have and be more deliberate about having conversations that feed your soul? Ah, that's so hard. That's so hard. (laughs) Because funny, even like if you're intentionally looking for a church, it's really, it's incredibly difficult. I I think you mentioned in the book um, at one point, I think Rachel Held Evans and some others who had like kind of tried to create a new version of church. And I remember when we first started this podcast, that was my, my, that was my idea too. I was like, we're going to help people figure out how to create, like, we're going to do it right this time. And then Mm -hmm. after years of doing it, I'm like, 
that no, that's what everybody's been trying to do for centuries. It's, you know, and it's yes. <laughs> it's not about creating a new way of doing church. It's about like creating a church, like the community within that church and what they stand for and what they believe and and uh what's important to them, you know, and and uh less about like because there are, there are churches out there, there are Lutheran churches who are killing it, you know, are doing mm-hmm. a great job of being loving and inclusive and open and everything that, you know, we believe Jesus is all about. And then there are Lutheran churches out there doing a terrible job at that. And the same thing within every other denomination or non-denomination across the country. Um, and so then it came, it, it like occurred to me that it's less about the church itself and it's more about the people, well, the church, I guess, yeah, the people. The- Yes, the Big C Church. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. And one of the things that I've been sad to lose about the idea of an institutional church as a major player in our culture is the like, you stumble into a town at night and you don't know where to go, you know, kind of like having that signpost, where do you go if you're homeless? Where do you go if you're an asylum seeker? Not that the the problem being, of course, that that the church has not been (laughs) the best place for that so far, which is why we're, but I, I want it to be that so badly. And I think that that is why in the deconstruction process, so many people stop off at the way station of we're going to be the church that does it right. Because yeah. there's something that they still want, whether it's community for themselves and their families, social, like so the social gospel, whether it's, there's something that they want to give. There's some value that they've seen. And I still very much have that, like, man, I want there to be some kind of institution to where it's not so heavy on individuals, to yeah. where I don't have to wake up every day and feel like, You know, I've got to contribute to a just world in, in the sense that if I don't do it, no one is, which is way more narcissistic than I need to be on any given day, no matter what, (laughs) but having a church, having an institution and having people around you who you go like, okay, if I can't take the clothes to the women's shelter, Betty can, if I can't take food to this family who just lost their father, Maria can. And that to me is what we lose. Yeah. And, and the hardest thing probably to get back is that the diffusion of effort in loving the world. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash deconstructionists and get on your way to being your best self. Life is really hard, guys. It, it just is. And uh, sometimes you need somebody to talk to, somebody who's a licensed professional who can help teach you coping skills and help you move through the obstacles that life throws in front of you. Personally, uh, I would not have gotten through this year without therapy. You know, I lost my mother this year. Uh, my dad went through some pretty serious surgery. Um, the normal relationship issues, you know, life stuff that happens and is unavoidable. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's good to go to have someone to talk to to help you process that uh, and and move through it. And so therapy has been a huge, huge beneficial thing for me in my life. I go every week uh, and I do it online as well. So, you know, whether or not you've tried therapy before uh, or if you've if you've hesitated for various reasons, sometimes, you know, unfortunately, in the U.S., therapy can be quite expensive. And so. The great thing about BetterHelp.com is they make it affordable, and it's 100% online. You don't need to go in anywhere. It's all online. So, you know, check it out. Go to the website. You can uh, fill out a brief questionnaire there, and they'll match you with a therapist. And guess what? If the therapist, if you don't like them, kind of like, you know, you're trying to find a good hairstylist, you know, once you find a good one, you want to stick with them, but not everybody's great, you know? Same thing with therapy. If you don't like the therapist you get matched with, you can switch anytime. Super, super easy. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash deconstructionist. That's betterhelp, dot com slash deconstructionist. Yeah, the, just the ability to quickly mobilize when help is needed. And mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think about that. I think about the, the fact that I think there are it's just harder to find 
those churches um, for one. And, but I do, I do see, I am hopeful because I also see people like a Glennon Doyle uh, out there who has a massive platform and has the ability to mobilize tons of people and raise tons of money for good causes in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. And so like, I am hopeful that through technology and the internet, you know, it can be used for good. Um, Absolutely. That, that, that maybe there's some, some picking up of the slack there that was kind of left behind by like organized churches. But I, I do still have hope though, that there are organized churches out there who at the end of the d- end of the day are practicing good theology and are practicing what they preach in, in regards to the teachings of Jesus and, can be a healthy community and can mobilize and do good things in the world. Yeah. I just think it's harder to harder to find maybe these days. Yeah. And there, I mean, a lot, I, I get to talk to a lot of them because in my work as a journalist, I write for Sojourners. I do stuff for Christianity Today. And so they know Christianity Today knows who, who to assign me to and who not to. <laughs> um, so like when a church is doing a really good job on creation care, or, you know, environmental stewardship, that's who they'll send me to interview. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, so I get to meet these folks and or the the churches that are opening up their doors to asylum seekers or that kind of thing. Yeah, those are the folks that I get to talk to. And so from where I'm standing, it's like, yeah, there's there's so many. It's across the United States. This you know the 25 <laughs> that I've yeah. gotten to interview spread out across the entire United States, and all of them are struggling with budget. They're struggling with attendance. They're Mm. struggling with, I mean, it's not like these are the mega churches, right? I'm not saying that there aren't any spiritually healthy mega churches, but a lot of these great churches are struggling with like practical realities of keeping their doors open. (laughs) Yeah. It's really sad. Adam and I used to talk about this all the time. We, we have kind of a allergic reaction to uh, mega churches in general. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, uh, it, but they do the one thing that they do really well is they're very, very good at marketing a product. And these old denominational churches who may, maybe perhaps are practicing a little more healthy theology are, are not, you know. And it's my, my, so my dad is a uh, retired Lutheran pastor and was an old man when he was a baby, you know, so like <laughs> loves organ music, but he's like, I don't understand why the kids don't come. I'm like, Dad, nobody wants to listen, sit down and listen to organ music for like an hour and a half. Like they just don't. And so he's always been very receptive and open to kind of changing the format a little bit. And I think there is something to that. I think some of these older um, traditional churches have to adapt and evolve with the times or they're going to continue to see their, their doors close. But I'm hoping though, that also these mega churches, these people will continue to go there. And and some of the ones that are not so healthy, they'll figure it out at the end of the day that like, Oh, this theology leaves me feeling very empty and um, not so inclusive and not so loving, and eventually they'll figure it out. Because I, I think I do think that at the end of the day, you vote with your wallet. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that is the reality, isn't it? Yeah. The other thing that actually in this moment is kind of self-inflicted damage for the church for churches is you can kind of see it in how they respond to people who are more progressive in their faith or who are deconstructing or who are asking questions. Yeah. Um, Talk, talk about that. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I think that just like people, I think you're right about this format. I think I really do. Because I was sitting in the sweet Lutheran church I was like, they do, they do organ music and stuff. And I was just like, (laughs) yeah, I can't, like, my heart is not stirred. (laughs) It's it's so loud. I love Bach. Um, Don't get me wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Like, well, I kind of like, if I'm going to listen to an organ, I want to be in an empty chapel somewhere in like rural France. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I I need to be able to leave when I want. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Um, But anyway, (laughs) I think that, just for so long when things started to change, there started to be more contemporary musical desires and people started to want more from church. There was a group of kind of fussy, stodgy old guys who were just like, that's being, they're just wanting a product and that's not what we're about. And they, they started to like create all of these theological moral reasons why they couldn't compromise 
Yeah. And, and I think shot themselves in the foot in a lot of ways. And then that, so that any discussion of what am I getting out of this has turned kind of, they're allergic to that. They're, uh, they want you to show up out of a sense of like loyalty and duty. And when you start, like I've had pastors have bad reactions to the title of my book because mm. the idea that the church is letting you down is inherently heretical to them because the church doesn't need to live up to my expectations and like, it's not about me. And so you really have this resistance to accountability for how they're affecting people. And they would put it as people being choosy people wanting to, you know, shop around and pick and scratch all their itches and whatnot. I don't think that's it. I think it is. If you can be the like you can have your organ music and it can be off key. And if you're loving people and they're there and they're the people that they're taking communion with, they feel deeply connected to and whatnot. They will, they might ask you, can we please do a contemporary service, but they're <laughs> going to hang in there. I think that the, the question under the question is how are you affecting people? What, in, what are you doing to people <laughs> for good or ill? And that's the question that they still don't there. I'm still seeing another chance for there to be another self-inflicted wound of handling this new question of how have you harmed people? Cause a lot of people who are deconstructing have been harmed or how have you become irrelevant? And the church that asks that self, themselves that question and goes and starts to seek repair and make amends and do better is going to be, have one story and the church that just says you're the problem, you know, any harm that you did was because you didn't come with the right heart or whatever. I think it's, it's getting just getting easier and easier for people to be like, then I'm going to leave. <laughs> yeah. And, and the Pew studies and, uh, and various other studies have shown that people are leaving in droves. And it's like, you make this great point at what point, you know, after thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, have been hurt in some form or fashion and are now leaving and refuse to return. Do you have to look at yourself and take some accountability and say, well, what are we doing? That's pushing all these people away. And in some cases, putting people into therapy, you know, like what, in many at what cases. point, yeah. At what point do you take responsibility for that and say, all right, we, we have to self examine because I mean, that takes a certain amount of humility, but I mean, don't they talk about that in the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> My thought would be that that would be a good spiritual practice, but yes. it is one. There's a whole, we just have a lot of pastors right now. And I meant this comes up in the book uh, with a, one of the early chapters about why people get hurt by the church. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is because when they bring their complaint, the pastor's trained to defend the faith, not to care for people. And the pastor immediately goes, um, no, your hurt doesn't mean anything bad about the church because the church needs to prevail and the church is under attack. And they've adopted this kind of the moral majority conservative, you know, political posture of don't let the church come under scrutiny. Don't let anything be like if you, they're defensive, they have a defensive posture. And that I think causes a lot of harm. And again, I'm seeing it in this response to my book where people are just like, and I was laughing. My husband and I were laughing when one pastor had that reaction because he was like, he's an architect. And he goes, if I saw an article that said how architects are letting us down, I would devour it. I would yeah. be in there going, okay, how do I not be that architect? How do I figure out? Cause there are problems with the built environment. How do I not contribute to them? <laughs> and he's like, it really says something if you're not open to hearing how you can avoid hurting people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird when you replace it with any other profession. Yeah. You know, <laughs> almost like, every other profession is like, yes, please. I don't want to be one of those. 
Yeah, if like half my employees quit and their exit interview was like John sucks as a manager, you know, like I would be like, all right, we need to sit down and figure out what's going on here, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with religion, we treat it very, very differently. It's it's strange. Um, it is. It's strange. I think if you're if you look at history, you see kind of how it happened. In mm. I think it has everything to do with politics. Unfortunately, I think that I'm writing a story right now for Texas Monthly about kind of that, about how um, learning how to pivot any conversation to this is an attack on God gives you all of the latitude that you need to keep fighting. Interesting. Oh, I can't wait to read that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to watch a lot of Ted Cruz. Um, oh boy. <laughs> talks. And so I hope that other people enjoy what I have done for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a sacrifice that uh, I'm not sure I could make. Honestly. Yeah. It's <laughs> literally just, would go get a beer at the end of the day to be like, yeah. I need to like, I think I need to poison this out of my point. mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, one of the things you bring up too, and this is something that we've talked a lot about on the show is just that a lot of, um, uh, Christian kind of, uh, I don't know, streams of thought, especially in the United States. It, it is, as you say, so intertwined with politics here. Um, but it also like the, the, the common theme amongst all of them seems to be, uh, the fear, the fear factor. And you talk about this in the book, like we can use fear and, you know, terrify people and use that as a way to control. But as you say, also rightly so that fear has never been a good tactic for changing anyone's heart. It keeps them in check for a while, but ultimately long-term it doesn't work. Right. It only works as long as you're the scariest person in the room. And this is where there's just a lot of overlap with parenting because like, you know, fear-based parent, if you're trying to get your kid to obey based on being the biggest threat, you know, um, eventually they're going to care more about what their peers think than what you think, more about what their spouse thinks, more about what their boss thinks. Somebody else is going to take that spot as the number one threat. And if you haven't, trained them how to like internalize these beliefs, these ethics, these morals, then they're just, they follow the morals of whoever is threatening them. (laughs) And, um, that I think is true in parenting. And we learn it from the way we were pastored. I think that if you're fear, if you're parenting based on the belief that obedience is the one thing your child has to do, as long as they obey you, that's like the chief virtue. You probably picked that up from a pastor that does not want you to question them. And that is going to tie you questioning them to the eternal um, destiny of your soul or a politician who wants you to vote for them and says that if you don't vote for them, then America is going to go down the drain. Like there's those tactics mobilize people in the moment, but they only work if you stay terrifying. And so you'd also see an escalation in how terrifying you can be. Oh man. Yeah. That's so good. Um, And I just think I found the quote for the, beginning of the episode. Thank you for that. <laughs> Just made it. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's perfect. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> sometimes it takes me hours. I got to dig around, you know, and then, but yeah, that one's, that one's perfect. But, um, so talk about that though. Like when you, so like, like I said earlier, I started to ask questions when I knew that I was going to have another tiny human being kind of relying on my guidance and wisdom. So you, you talk about parenting and parenting is hard enough, especially if it's the first time you've never parented before. Uh, and it's that night where you, the first night alone with the baby and you're like, no one told me what to do with this baby. Um, and I'm alone and I'm afraid I'm going to drop it, you know? So it, it's so <laughs> surreal. You're like, they let me go home with this. Thing. Like <laughs> they no, trust me to do oh this. My gosh, yeah. You can just walk out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard enough. And then, you know, you throw in other things you mentioned, and I do want to make make note of this too, because I, I'm a big advocate for mental health and, and well-being. And you mentioned postpartum depression, which mm. I don't think it's enough attention. Uh, my ex-wife uh, went through it. It was brutal. And um, 
and, and for anybody out there who, who's gone through it, I, I feel for you. And, um, it just, you know, makes an already difficult transition even harder. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, I definitely feel for the women out there who have gone through it and, you know, ho- thankfully there are resources, but I, I don't think it's probably talked about enough. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I think that we haven't talked about it to the point of being able to understand how many different ways it can look. Um, I think that's part of what's happening in the mental health conversation now is that, okay, first we had to acknowledge that these things existed and that was enough of a fight. Now we need to acknowledge that they can look a bunch of different ways. So I, I agree. I think that more women will be able to get help if they're not just looking for not being able to get out of bed crying, if they're looking for some other things too. Yeah. And, and I think their partners, um, we have to do a better job of, of identifying that and acknowledging it and being the support system that they need in those moments, yeah. whatever that looks like. So <laughs> whatever, yeah. figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like... you know, the very least saying, you know, like what, what can I do, you know, and, yeah. and what can we do together? And, um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of folks out there who go untreated for it and it just makes an already tough situation even, even that much harder. So, so true. Yeah. Yeah. So talk, talk about like how that changed things for you though. Cause you were already kind of going through a questioning phase and, and, um, and now you've got uh kid's dad in the mix. So obviously that probably intensified, um, a lot of things. <laughs> so talk about that. It did because even if you yourself have changed your system, your beliefs, whether, you know, I think a lot for a lot of people who are deconstructing their faith piece by piece, you know, it's, they haven't just walked away. I mean, there are some people who I think they're just, their inherent disposition makes it very possible for them to be like, peace out. I don't, I'm not doing this anymore. And they leave and they left, leave everything at the door. And I can't speak to that journey as much (laughs) because, and I say in the book, like some people have perfect peace about the new place that they have found. They're raising their kids in it. You know, my people are the ones who are doing it piece by piece and being like, oh shoot, do I have to deal with that too? I used to know how I felt about that or what I believed about that. Now I'm not sure. I pulled this piece and that piece fell. And, um, that that's me and my <laughs> people are the the endlessly tinkering people and doing that as an adult it's fine cuz at the end of the day nobody's asking for an answer and if i say if i call if i have a great conversation with a friend and i'm like really arguing against substitutionary atonement and i'm like no jesus blood wasn't necessary he died for everybody and it's universal and all this stuff if i'm having that. And then the next day I read something else, I can call him up and be like, uh, I don't know about that. And it's just this kind of ongoing, we understand that it's a process. We understand it's in flux. We understand what it means to once have been sure about something and now to not be sure about it. And you're talking to kids who start out They don't even understand that something they see right now, if I cover it with a blanket, that it's still there. I mean, you're talking to people whose brains are not, they don't understand time. They don't, they start out without object permanence. They have all of this development to do. And it's very hard to talk about, answer their questions, to talk about things with ambiguity, with, I'm going to give you this answer now. It might change. Kids hate that. Um, <laughs> You're right. It's it's very difficult. And so for me, the crisis that kids brought about was like, oh, I'm suddenly going to have to articulate some of the things that I've just been kind of like, yeah, I'll deal with that later. Like, I don't know what I think about that. I'll get to it later. Nobody's asking. And the then suddenly they just want a simple answer. Like when my father-in-law died. They just wanted to know what had happened. (laughs) Yeah. And so in some of the things, I would say most of the things I have crossed each bridge as I've gotten there because I know that I am going to, that bridge is going to look different in five years and they should get the five years from now version if that's when they're going to cross it. 
rather than telling them now. And then in five years being like, remember that let's let's, and maybe that happens, but I'd like to do it as little as possible (laughs) for the sake of their brains. But um, yeah. So with kids, it was, what was happening was partially that. And then the other part was just also that we're trained or raised by our culture to be very nervous about getting it right about getting parenting right, not just religion, but their sleep schedules and what they eat and how they relate to school and all that stuff. And so I was just scared of screwing them up. Right. So yeah. You can leave fundamentalism or whatever and still be a perfectionist who wants to get it all right. And so um, those two things together were making a pretty potent. And then those two things plus postpartum anxiety pretty much had me sidelined for the first year of my son's life. Yeah, that's that's a brutal mix right there. Um, <laughs> and you talk about perfectionism and parenting as a Christian and and um, just how the two are kind of intertwined in that way. Like we, we're so obsessed with certainty and, and having our beliefs right. Um, and then you, you kind of parallel it with, with parenting where, and I remember this too, everybody's an expert. Everybody has, this is the way you got to parent, you know, like, no, you have to, you have to breastfeed at certain times or no, you just wait till the baby like lets you know that it's hungry or no, you got to do this. And it's just like, you're just getting inundated with different ideas or opinions on how to do it right. And right. yeah, you're right. You're absolutely terrified. I thought I broke my daughter. Um, somehow as like a two week old, she rolled herself off the couch when I was trying to get her binky from under and I, and she like hit the floor and squawked. And I was like, Oh God, I broke it. You know, and I've I, done it. I, I, I've messed up fatherhood. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I remember I picked her up and I ran into the other room and I was like, Oh my God, you know, like I've broken our child and it's barely two weeks old. And, and <laughs> turns out kids are pretty durable, you know, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> she's fine. She's thriving, you know, um, <laughs> But no, uh, no signs of, imper- of permanent damage. No, no, not yet. Um, but yeah, so like it, there, there are a lot of weird parallels there with, with parenting and, you know, a life of faith and like our obsession with certainty. Yeah. Certainty sells is my thing. It's, it's certainty is what gets you a following. It's having something to say. And I think even when I was pitching this book, some of the feedback I got from publishing houses was, can you make it more of a how to like people want, especially no. from parenting books. <laughs> yeah. Especially from parenting. No, <laughs> no. I said, I just was like this, it's kind of like important to the thrust of the book that it's not a how to, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm kind of trying to make the point that the how to's are killing us. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I write one, that's going to be weird, <laughs> Yeah, but they do sell. Because people are looking for something to say, if you do this, you'll be safe. If you pray the sinner's prayer, you will go to heaven. If you, you know, spank your children, they will not go to jail. (laughs) That kind of thing. They want an answer. They want a sure thing because we actually don't want to live lives of faith. We want to live lives of knowing. And that to me is so clear in parenting because when you become a parent, you're biologically in protect, protect, provide, you know, make you're, you're so devoted to this kid and you don't want anything bad to happen and you want them to have everything that they need. And so you'll buy anything. (laughs) Yeah. My bookshelf just exploded (laughs) after I had kids. I was like, (laughs) how do I make sure that they're literate? You know, they're, you know, the day we came home from the hospital, I'm like propping them up for tummy time with the book. And I'm like, okay, I want your brain to make all the little connections that it needs to make <laughs> completely unnecessary, you know? And now I'm there six and eight and I am very tired and they watch a lot of Pokemon. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and I don't see them getting any dumber. No, but, no. So that's, I think that's a lot of our love of certainty is because we just want it to save us. We just want it to make, we want some guarantee that we're going to be okay. Yeah. It's, it's easier and it's more assuring certainly. Um, 
but really that it doesn't reflect the realities of life. Life is very gray. Life is very messy and nuanced. And that's what makes it beautiful too. But like to be able to categorize it in a way that, you know, like Richard Rohr talks about um, dualism and the, and the um, dangers of dualistic thinking, you're, you're trying to put this very gray reality into black and white and it just doesn't work that way. And when we try it, gets really gross. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing for me is that it's not just that it doesn't work. It'd be one thing if it was like, well, this is inadequate, but it's harmful. Yeah. And that's because you end up telling a lot of gray things that they're bad. And that's not necessarily like you're looking gray is a mix of black and white. And you end up just looking for the black particles and discounting the white or, you know, to be more, to be, to be less, racially problematic. The white can be the bad parts. The white can be the voids and the black can be the fullness. And you can be looking for the little voids in life and trying to get rid of them instead of looking at where the fullness is, you know, the little black dots. And so that's, that is to me, the bigger problem with certainty is not just that like, Hey man, it's not going to work out sometimes and you're going to be disappointed and you're going to be left with questions. It's that you're probably going to hurt people and condemn people in the process. And that's, that's the bigger problem to me. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I really loved in the book and, uh, uh, I can't wait to share this with my dad when he is awake again. My dad is, uh, I think I told you about this earlier. My dad just went through major surgery yesterday. So he's still, he's still very heavily sedated right now. So <laughs> he's going to pretend to still be sedated. If you greet him with a book when he wakes up, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you haven't Welcome met my dad. Back, my dad. dad is a walking library. So oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> When my mom was still with us, she had to, uh, she, she gave him a book allowance every month so that he would not go over it. And <laughs> he often went over it. So oh, I'm, yeah. I'm days away from that with my husband. I'm sure of it. Every time a package <laughs> arrives, he's like, Hmm, another, another more, book, huh? More books. <laughs> my mom would yell at him all the time because he would ask for books for Christmas. And then she would find that he had already started right. reading them before. She's like, what are you doing? You know, like, yeah. So now he's left unchecked. So we'll see if I have any inheritance left by this is when this is all said and done. You're going to get a bunch of books. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to hear it his library. Like, thanks dad. Um, but no, he, he and I talk about all the time and, and you nail this, you talk about, and I'm, oh, I'm going to butcher this name so bad. Um, this theologian, Eka, Eka Mini. Oh yes. Yeah. Got it. Uh, you on? You on? Okay, cool. Um, where we talk about, you talk about, decolonizing Christian discipleship um, and, and like kind of just looking at theology and, and is it harmful or is it, is it benefiting us? Are we thriving as a result? And my dad and I always talked about this and he said, you know, he has a much more simplistic (laughs) version of this, but he says, "I, I, I feel like at the end of the day, if we look at what we believe and if it doesn't result in love, because, you know, we believe that God is love, that if it doesn't result in love, then it's probably not of God. And so you, you quote her and she says, um, she has a, I want to read a couple of these bullet points here. She says, does this theology call me to a deep love for God that causes me to pursue holiness and radical love for my neighbor? Does this theology benefit the privileged at the expense of the marginalized? Is this theology good news for everyone, regardless of their racial and socioeconomic status? Does this theology cause me to look in the mirror and marvel at God's handiwork instead of despising my reflection? And when I close my eyes and picture Jesus, do I see a white man or a brown skinned Palestinian man? And I read that and I thought that is exactly what my dad and I have been talking about in kind of a more simplified version, but for years, and like that's such a good reminder. Yeah. And she's speaking specifically in the context of is my theology like colonized has it been shaped by a colonial mindset of white supremacy I think it's even bigger than that though you yeah know? well and yeah. so later in the book i go into if you zoom out from that it augustine who you know we all have a complicated relationship to augustine but he's <laughs> yeah. the hermeneutic of love guy who says if it's not if you're if your reading of scripture doesn't result in bigger better love for your neighbor you're reading it wrong yes and that so it's that idea that she's she's speaking specifically to the our the way we've been colonized, the way we've been trained by a colonial mindset to read the Bible, which is harmful and um 
ubiquitous in the United States. I don't think, I think that she can say that and it can apply so broadly because that's how broadly our, our theology and doctrine and practice of church has been shaped by a colonial system. But Mm -hmm. you can put that lens on, you know, on gender, on sexuality, on economics, on many, many, many things. And, and then just on people who disagree with me. (laughs) Yeah. And you can start to see how, um, that hermeneutic of love that Augustine talks about is so much more well fit to the gray parts of life that you talked about. It's so much more um, dexterous in those situations. Yeah, I'm glad that you you brought up the the grayness of life again because you have this great you have this great section that I loved and probably because it's fresh in my mind. My daughter is obsessed with Marvel right now, and so we just went through the chron- chronological order. You know, um, not necessarily the order in which they were released, but the the true chronology or whatever. And so she is she's in it. We just saw the Marvel exhibit at COSI, the Science Center here. It's great, but you have this brilliant moment where you take something that's uh you know very popular and and understandable on a, on a child's level and you use it as this great example of like working through the trap of like dualistic thinking and embracing the messy gray of life through bucky barnes and the story of redemption so talk about that i thought that was brilliant i love that thank you thank you um so my when my son first started getting into marvel he was very, it was good guys, bad guys, you know, he wanted, and he was seeing it as in, as many children do, you know, the, the Avengers are the good guys and whoever else, whether it's Hydra or Ultron or whoever is the bad guys. And I do a lot of education reporting and restorative discipline is a big topic. And so I had done a lot of thinking about how we see bad behaviors and how we see criminality um, and changing our view of that and looking for what does it mean for a person to be able to make amends, to be able to be restored to our community? What does it mean for someone to be able to get help instead of be punished? All of that stuff. And so as he was talking about um, Hydra versus the Avengers, it it was the perfect opportunity to say, well, what about Bucky Barnes? Because Bucky fought for both sides. And we know like how much would it have been justice for Bucky to be killed with Hydra when we know that he was taken captive. We know that he was, and he's still responsible for his actions. You know, he's still in uh, Captain America and the winter soldier He still has to go has list of amends that he has to make because those things that he did, he did, and he's accountable for them. It's not saying that we're not accountable for our actions. It's saying that our actions aren't, don't condemn us. He's not condemned, but he doesn't have to die because he was taken captive, brainwashed (laughs) and used as a weapon (laughs) of evil. He, can be redeemed, he can make amends, and he can be restored to community with his friend, Steve Rogers. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't go into the, that deep with, with my son. I just said, isn't it better that Captain America got his friend back than having to lose his friend forever? Yes. But, um, and he hasn't seen Captain America and the Winter Soldier, to be fair. He was four at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was a little, that was a little bloody. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were mostly yeah, watching cartoons still at that point. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I said, but does that mean that Bucky doesn't have to, I think I said, say I'm sorry and and make an amend for all of the things? And he said, no, no, that's true. And in my mind, I was like, someday that will make sense because we'll watch that. But anywho, yeah. And I think the Hulk, honestly, are 
we've been taught as Christians and parents to use stories, to use our common myths, to tell a certain story for a long time. But it's a good versus evil story that we've been kind of taught, like Lord of the Rings, that kind of stuff. And what's available to us, because these people who create these stories are are human themselves, and I think that it's up to us to draw it out, is not the Avengers versus Hydra story, but the story of Bucky Barnes. And, you know, finding that within our, our stories and bringing that out for our kids, I think, is a really valuable tool. And that's, that's brilliant. I mean, it kind of goes back to the work of like Joseph Campbell, who talked, who talked, you know, throughout his career about, you know, having to modernize and come up with new myths and, and new ways to tell our story as a, as a human species. But that's something that like a child can kind of understand you. Maybe you can't get into, you know, metaphor and hyperbole, you know, when it comes to the Bible with like an eight year old or a five year old, but like, that's something they, you know, Avengers, they get that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's very real to them. And so like, that's a way to kind of communicate the sort of the same truths that these biblical stories are trying to communicate, but in a way that maybe their tiny little brains can understand. Also, if you're unsure, if like, if you're in that place with the Bible where you're like, I don't know if I can answer the follow-up questions here about like, well, why did God <laughs> right. tell Israel to kill all the children? Why did, you know, Jonah, was Jonah, was the big fish real? That If you're not ready for that question, I feel no problem accidentally screwing up the MCU and like getting the message wrong <laughs> and using it to my own ends. Totally right. comfortable. And if he has follow-up questions, I can very easily be like, oh, here, I'll make something up. Don't care. So I think it has made like a nice substitute for the Bible when I've been like, I don't really want to go there because I don't know what I'm going to say when they inevitably ask X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And I think, you know, Jesus was around today, like using kind of pop culture and contemporary things like he, his, his, uh, you know, his, his stories and his uh, parables probably would have been talking about the MCU perhaps. I, so I'd like to think so. I like to think yeah. Jesus would have been an MCU fan. For sure. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> or at so, least Star so talk- Wars. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I'd be like, Oh, hero's journey all over that. I get it. You know? Um, but uh, yeah. So talk about like, you know, cause I know we're running short on time here, but like talk a little bit about like, so obviously we, you know, the book does a great job of talking about kind of how we ended up here and kind of the struggles within specifically, you know, for the most part, like American Christianity, um, you know, at large. Uh, so like we, we, we kind of know like what we're dealing with and how we ended up here. But then, you know, again, the question remains. And again, you talked a little bit about um, using more common day or modern day metaphors. So how do we have those types of conversations with our kids, you know, as they grow up and, and their brains aren't fully formed yet, you know? Mm. I think the the good advice I'm using is kind of the Montessori method of letting them participate. I think that one of the big errors that was that led to a lot of problems in the way many of us were raised was that the parent was the holder of wisdom and they had to get it into the kid and we had to get right thinking and that any question that we asked had to have an answer and we needed to know that right answer and in internalize that right answer. And I am finding that when I let my children ask the questions and when I let them participate and have ideas in the conversation, it makes it gentler. It lowers the stakes for me. So I'm not feeling that like, Oh my gosh, I have to steer you right because it's not my conversation. It's our conversation and they have just as much agency in it as I do. Like, they get to have an idea too. And I might say, well, here, well, let's think about that though. Or like, and it's a, it's a conversation. And I think that there's, I mean, people talk about having the sex talks this way, like letting it be more of a, what comes up naturally and getting, where are you on this rather than here's where you need to be on this. And how do I go where you are and infuse that with some good guidance and some good, wisdom rather than drawing a circle and saying, get in there and don't leave with regard to theology, with regard to sex, with regard to kindness toward others. There's kids have all sorts of weird ideas about, you know, who is deserving of their kindness. And, you know, is 
it, it's not just about cons- the conservative values, even as wanting a child to be kind or respectful of other people's boundaries. I have to be just as patient with their development with that. I can't say, you know, you're a bad person now because you violated their agency. You know, <laughs> you did not ask consent before you, you held their hand. You know, I need to be as patient with their development and say, okay, well, what made you think you could do that? Well, how do you, how do you think it made them feel? Do you feel like your relationship is better now? Are you maybe not hearing them? It's all about inviting them, I think, to construct for the first time. We might be deconstructing, but we have to keep in mind that they're constructing for the first time and they need to be an active participant in that. Yeah, that's really good because it, it also, I firmly believe and have believed for some time now that you can't, you can't take someone's journey for them or put them on the path. Like you have to allow them to get there on their own. And so Adam and I talked about years ago, how, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited for when our kids start to get older and start to naturally organically have those questions that we had. And then the kind of fun, interesting conversations that will result, um, you know, as a byproduct of that. And saying, yeah. you know, like when maybe my daughter comes to me and says, well, did Jonah really get swallowed by a whale? And we can talk about, well, maybe that's not really the important part of the story, you know? Right. Maybe it's about, can you forgive your worst enemy and what that looks like, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, starting to have a little bit more in-depth, you know, conversations that are, you know, a little a little deeper maybe than she can handle right now, you know, as, a, yeah. as an eight-year-old. Yeah. I love that's good. that. Yeah. So... Uh, what are what are your hopes for for this book? You know, like um, you know, when people read it, what is what is your what is your grand vision? Um, <laughs> it's like I, what my hope is that people read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, they should. Really, what I good. what I want them to do is is to start a conversation. I want it to mm. lead to conver- like seeking out other people who are on this journey, so that the people aren't so lonely. I want people to feel like there's someone else out there, not me necessarily, but other people who are in the book. I want them to see themselves and their journeys and the stories that are in there. If their story is like mine, then, you know, on the page is being that friend for the journey. But basically I just want people to know that they're not alone and that they're not the only people going through this and to kind of have some camaraderie in the chaos that is raising kids without a obedience-based structure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's such a big part of it is, is it, it just comes back to that community aspect that, that we've kind of lost over the years. And, yep. you know, it's like, we, it's a hard lesson we've been learning for centuries now, you know, like when the temple was destroyed and everybody's like, Oh no, that's where God lives. What will we do now? It's like, no, no, no. God is everywhere. God is not mm-hmm. just living in this, this structure. And so finding community, maybe outside of church and maybe in a way that looks different. Um, As you said, maybe it's just a really, maybe church now and community is a group of people that you meet with for um, coffee and Mm -hmm. um, are just there to support one another, you know, in all of life's messy complications. And maybe that's, maybe that's church. Yeah. I don't know. And if you want to use the book to start some of those conversations, I'm all for it. (laughs) And uh, for you guys out there who may not have a copy yet, there's some great, discussion uh section in the back there where you can kind of kickstart that that sort of uh you know discussion in your group so bringing up kids when church lets you down by becca mcneil thank you so much for coming on the book is wonderful go out and get it where can people stay up on top of what you're up to and where can they get a copy of the book so uh, social media i'm on social media instagram twitter facebook all of that um and then my website is becca mcneil.com and there you can kind of portal into all the other things and get in touch with me directly. The contact form on there gets you right to my inbox. Perfect. Well, I'll put all of that in the show notes. So all the links will be in there. So if you guys want to connect, get on there, grab a copy of the book you guys have been asking for for seven years now. Now I have it. It's here. Uh, Becca was kind enough to, uh, to write it. Uh, and so now, now you can stop asking. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are no more questions. I've answered That's them right. all. That's <laughs> right. They're all in the book. Uh, it is a man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That was the first thing I would, we, we said the same thing. If we ever wrote a book on deconstruction, the first thing it would say is this is not a how to manual. Yeah. That's, I've been so adamant for everyone. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I know that you came here looking for answers. I don't have them, but I have some great questions because I know you need more of those. <laughs> 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 no, it's a, it's a wonderful resource, uh, and and thank you for writing it. Um, people go out and get it; it's great. I uh, highly recommend it. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Where the company line was the only way to get paid. We built. Church uncertainty that fears everything against it. Where the refugee suffers and the white man has it made. I won't do it anymore. It's taken me.
Start a journey, not a fad. Kick off your fitness journey with up to $500 off Peloton Bike, Bike Plus, or Tread packages. Choose the package that will take your training to the next level with accessories like our cycling shoes, heart rate band, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. Join now and you'll see why 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. All access membership separate. Offer ends January 8th, 2023. Excludes Bike, Bike Plus, and Tread Basics. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com.